I want to talk about how within a cross-disciplinary network thinking out of the box could be very useful and that bio-inspirational thinking could be very helpful to tackle societal challenges as we are confronted with um, today. Now to tackle these challenges of society today requires all kinds of novel approaches, cross-disciplinary approaches, because it no longer is sufficient to focus on one's own discipline. To tackle these challenges, it's also extremely important to gather data at a scale which is several orders of magnitude larger than we are commonly used to, or at least were used to, and associated with that, require data processing methods that are extremely powerful to deal with large data sets, but also that are extremely reliable to make predictions based on the data sets. And to tackle societal challenges today, especially the ones related to human health, is that we have to look beyond humans. If you really want to understand the broader picture of what the problems in human health systems is about. Well, let's take an example. Why not one everyone will most likely have heard of? So COVID-19, if we look at it, it is or it has been clear that it's extremely important to look beyond humans and look at animal sources related to that. Whether it's trying to understand how it got transmitted from a bat species to a pangolin species to humans, how it got modified into the process, but also trying to understand why can these animals transmit the pathogen but don't get sick or don't show the symptoms that humans show, because that could help us to understand what's going wrong in humans. It's also clear that it's a matter of knowing more, modifying how we should interpret and tackle it. In the beginning, we knew very little about COVID. Now we knew more, we know more, but at the same time, we actually know that there's much to be known to really understand how the virus works and how it should be treated. And of course, we all want this fast, but also in a reliable way. The current rat race for finding the vaccine, um, everyone is concerned about the speed in trying to achieve that versus the reliability of finding that vaccine that does what it needs to do. So it's all about translational knowledge and skills if we want to tackle societal challenges today. And so there's a growing need for these translational knowledge and skills. And if we're talking about translational knowledge, well, one of the aspects is looking beyond humans and looking at other species. What can we learn from other species? Translational skills is then more looking at other disciplines and then see, okay, what can be useful to apply within our own discipline? So basically, the translation knowledge is looking within an evolutionary ancestry perspective and trying to get inspired by methods from other disciplines. So kind of bio-inspiration, let's say. Now, if you look at that, this is the kickoff of the Cross Health platform and several key players are involved. Animal health, human health, plant biotech, more engineering approaches with sensor device or sensor development, medical devices, but also data management and, and how to gather data, process data, find um, patterns in these data. We can actually narrow this down to a few key items. Well, human health and animal health is actually trying to understand physiological processes that underlie health. And by including animal health, we are also looking at that within an ancestry context. Plant biotech is then more trying to understand the underlying cellular machinery for these physiological, pro physiological processes. And then, well, with the sensors and the medical devices, measuring is knowing. So it's all about knowing what's going on, gathering the data to infer conclusions from that. But without proper methods to deal with that data, to understand the data, to extract patterns from that data, but also to develop models that in a predictive way can predict how things in the future or under certain conditions might change are extremely important. If I again narrow this down, well, we're talking about aspects of nature and we're talking about improving. 
So basically what the cross platform or cross health platform tries to do is learn from nature to improve society. Well, this is exactly what biomimicry is aiming for as well, but at a larger or broader scale. So this out of the box thinking and biomimicry could be useful for the cross health platform. And that's what I want to talk or tackle um, in this talk. So in general, it's considered that nature has managed to solve all the problems that have occurred throughout evolution. And well, it has definitely managed to deal or solve or come up with extreme solutions to extreme problems. Let's take uh, this group here, which are tardigrades, is a, a group of microscopic animals living in the tiny layer of water on top of leaves and so on. They're also called moss bears. Well, these guys, they can survive temperatures where we wouldn't think of being in for even a fraction of a second and come out well. They can survive pressures that are 75 times the pressure we would experience if we go down the Mariana Trench 10 kilometers below sea level. They can deal with 10,000 times the dose of radiation for which we would be diagnosed with acute radiation syndrome. And they can deal with 800 to 880 million times the UV radiation levels that are allowed for humans. So nature did solve some spectacular problems. But nature did not solve all the problems. It did solve many of the problems, but there are a bunch of limitations on how we should interpret how nature tried to solve the problems. Well, this is not the way as shown in this figure here, how evolution works. It's not from an ancestor and then something geometrically intermediate and then poops, we have a new species. That's not how evolution works. There are all kinds of limitations. There is the aspect of ancestry. That means an organism evolves from something that means it has to do with the tools that are available in the ancestor. It cannot just all out of the blue, something totally new can arise. There's natural selection that kind of defines what kind of variability or solutions are good enough to survive and remain and which ones are the ones that nature gets rid of. And then there's also trade-offs because an organism should not be considered as a compilation of hundreds of different functions where every function performs at its theoretical best. No, there are trade-offs be trade between all these functions and it's the organism as a whole that has to function properly. So nature and there's also biomimicry is not about maximizing and finding the best possible solution. It's about optimizing, finding the best combination with, as in nature, the least use of energy in order to get there. But despite the limitations, there's also a lot of opportunities when looking at nature. It has found billions of solutions, had the time to tweak existing designs over thousands of generations and has found solutions to billions and trillions and whatever kinds of conditions, different conditions in which problems needed to be solved. So if we want to understand the human health system, you can then wonder, well, shouldn't we then look at nature's health system? How that work and can we use that to translate to how the human health system should be interpreted? Well, nature health system is all about ecosystem resilience. If there is a perturbation, the resilience of all the partners or the, the, the items involved will compensate for that. So as a whole, it is a functional resilient ecosystem. And there are two key components to make this ecosystem resilient and functioning. One is the players themselves and how the players perform. The other is how these players interact with each other. So it's basically like a football team. A good football team is also more than just 10 players doing their own thing on the field. Let's take an example. This is a night out at an African savanna. The players in this ecosystem are grazers that feed on grass, leaf eaters that feed on the trees or the leaves of the trees, and in this case, also dung beetles. 
Well, there are all kinds of interactions between these players. The grazers feed on the grass, the leaf eaters on the trees, on the leaves. But the thing is that if they eat all that plant material, they produce dung. And the thing is that they go to specific places to take a shit. So you could say they, have, they use kind of shit parkings, if I could use the word. But that means that the nutrients for the plants that are present in the dung are concentrated in certain spots, but are absent in other spots. And this whole ecosystem resilience is kind of uh, dealt with thanks to dung beetles, because what they do, they take the dung, roll them in bowls, transport them to other players, dig holes, mix the dung with the soil, and in that way, fertilize the soil in other places that the grasses and the trees can use to grow. So this is an example of how this system works and in any perturbations of any of these interrelationships can be compensated by the behavior of the other players. So the question then is, can we still compare the human health system with such a nature health system? And a human um, is, or can we talk about the human ecosystem resilience that is still comparable to a nature ecosystem resilience? Well, I think it, it's pretty obvious that this is no longer the case, that nature or human health system has been disconnected from the same processes going on in nature because of medical innovations and technological innovations. So what is the context of this ecosystem in which human health system um, is going on today? Well. Human health system is mainly about identifying discomfort in humans that are going from mild discomfort to life-threatening discomforts and treating them, but also trying to understand the underlying mechanisms to prevent things going on. The today human health system takes into consideration also the human gene pool as we are as human population today and interprets all sources of discomfort from this human gene pool. And it sees the, the, the sources or the causes of all these kinds of discomforts within the human gene pool of today, within the current industrial ecosystem. But if this is the approach how we look at it, one should wonder, well, is this good enough? For example, if I would say that this picture represents very well what the current human gene pool would all be about. I guess that most of you would agree with me. Well, actually, I don't agree with that. The current human gene pool is even more depending on the gene pool that we have inherited, our genetic legacy that comes from all our direct and indirect ancestors over a million years, because there is the lineage of ancestry. So the genes we carry are the results of what happened in all our ancestors. So it should be considered way broader, the current human gene pool should be considered way broader than we are tempted to do. Is this truly the case? Well, it is. If we look at non-African population, each one of them, including us, contains 1-4% to of Neanderthal DNA. That means another species has, we have DNA of another species. If you put together all the allele variants that have been identified as Neanderthal of whole, this whole population together, we can compile about 40% of the total Neanderthal DNA that is still going around in that population of current human beings. It is even so that Melanesian and original Aboriginal Australians in addition to the Neanderthal DNA, also have 6 to 8% of Denisovan DNA, which is yet another species of humans. So Aboriginals contain DNA of three human species. So what is the current human gene pool then? Is this relevant in a context of human health system? Well, it is. If we look at the alleles that we have inherited from Neanderthals, and we now know that many of these alleles are there not by chance, but they have been positively selected for during early evolution, that many of them can be linked to health conditions, some in a positive way, but also several in a negative way, like immune responses, lipid metabolism, skin color, hair color, 
addiction, blood coagulation, mood disorder, diabetes, and so on. So it is relevant to consider the current human gene pool as being more than just homo sapiens gene pool. One could even go further, because if you, you would consider that genes that sh have analogies, as we see them in humans, also in other organisms, we even would have to consider the banana gene pool, because to some degree, we kind of have similar DNA, 60% DNA, similar to that of a banana. Okay, so what then about this current industrial ecosystem? Is that the ecosystem that has defined, that has molded the gene pool to what it is today? Well, it is not. This is the ecosystem that has guided human evolution. It's African savanna, a drying condition where going from a forested habitat to an open environment, getting adapted to heat, changing from quadrupedal, walking on four legs to walking on two legs, shifts in diet, shift in skin color once they migrated out of Africa. This are the natural conditions that defined how natural selection has filtered out what works good enough, what does not work good enough, and this is what we see now in the current human gene pool. So we don't see in the human gene pool what is only resulting from the conditions in the current industrial ecosystem. We see what's in the gene pool that occurred in our original ecosystem. So it would be kind of narrow-minded to see our ecosystem in which health systems should be considered relevant as the current industrial one. The same thing, it would be kind of narrow-minded to consider the human body as a cohesion of homo sapiens or human cells of one single individual. It's becoming more and more clear that our body or a human body is an ecosystem by itself in which human cells coexist with other organisms being bacteria and even with cells that are hybrids between human cells and viral entities. Right? not cells. So first let's look at these virus interaction with human cells. Yeah? We all know that if you contract some kind of viral infection like herpes or so, that the virus injects DNA in your cells and it emerges with your uh, own DNA and you cannot get rid of it or very difficult to do so. But I'm not talking about this interaction between human cells and viruses. I'm talking about historical, ancestral interactions where viral DNA got inserted in the DNA of our ancestors. And this goes far. For example, if you look at mammalian germline DNA, so which is inherited one generation after the other, and we're talking about mammalian ancestors, so not humans or primates, mammals, 10% of the germline DNA contains retroviral DNA. If we look at humans, 10% of human DNA even contains DNA of a specific group of retroviruses, endogenous retroviruses. And it's also clear that this historical infection, let's say, creating hybrid cells, has actually provided key innovation in mammalian evolution, which may even have determined whether or not we would be here as we are today. Because these retroviruses ha had two very important advantages for their own life cycle. First, they allow their protein mantle to easily fuse with the cell membranes of the cell they infect. So they can easily get in and mix their DNA with the human DNA. The second is they have an immunosuppressive function. So that means that they prevent the immune system from reacting against this invasion. Very interesting for a virus. But what happened during early mammal evolution is that the mixing of that endogenous retrovirus also allowed certain cells in an early embryo, human embryo, to allow membrane fusion and at the same time trigger a kind of immunosuppression that allowed the evolution and the origin of placentation. As you can see here, mammals in general, including humans of course, develop a placenta which is made of the fetus, which merges in some way with the womb of the mother. 
you would wonder, okay, but what's then so spectacular? Why was then the viral DNA ne needed? Well, think that a human fetus only contains 50% of the DNA that matches the body in which it's growing, that matches the body with which this tissue is merging into. That means the other 50% is alien DNA. Father's DNA is alien to mother's DNA. So why is a fetus not rejected? Because it's so different genetically, why is it not rejected just as we see with transplanted organs? Well, these endogenous re retroviruses have made this possible for placentation to occur. Now, if we know that the human body is an ecosystem, and we have viruses that are involved, but also other organisms like bacteria, and it is even so that the number, if you, if you take a human body, the number of cells that are human is largely outnumbered by the number of alien cells. Alien being not human, being bacteria. We have about 100 trillion bacterial cells in our gut. We have about a trillion bacterial cells on our skin. We have another trillion of bacteria in our hair, in vagina, in urinary, uh, urinary tract, um, and so on. So that puts the human body concept in a whole other perspective. We should not see the human body as the phenotype of an individual of Homo sapiens. We should actually see the human body as a walking ecosystem of billions of different organisms, of which humans is just human organism is just part of it. Is this just a happily living together and for the rest nothing more? No, that's not the case. It's clear that there is also an interaction between these organisms, and especially the bacteria. It is more and more becoming clear that the gut bacteria control what's going on in the body through a gut-brain connection, which works in both ways. And this gut-brain connection is established by immunoregulatory pathways, by neuroendocrine pathways, and even direct nerve connection. The vagal nerve goes from the brain directly through the gut, to the gut. So how does it then influence the human body? Well, at two levels. First, a pregnant mother, her gut microbiota, will influence fetal neurogenesis, meaning how the nervous system of the fetus will develop, how the nerve cells will develop, how they will differentiate, how they will form synaptic connections, how they will get myelinated, and so on. And this influence is happening within a certain restricted time window, but the thing is that once it gets established, it can have positive and, and essential effects that, that we need this gut. Uh, there was a very recent paper showing that we actually need this interaction to have proper neural development. But at the same time, it can also have long-lasting negative effects. And that's the same that we see then also in, in once the nervous system is fully developed, that the gut microbiota can be linked to what degree there is a direct causal relationship is sometimes not clear, but at least can be linked to a whole bunch of mental disorders with an immune response as an intermediate component. Um, Parkinson, Alzheimer, autism spectrum disorder, obesitas, uh, diabetes, several of them have been linked to how gut microbiota influence microglial cells, which are immune cells migrating around in the brain, thereby um, influencing or somehow triggering or influencing um, mental disorders. So if we want to understand and tackle the human health system in a more holistic approach as of today, we can thus wonder if we approach it as we generally do, are we using the complete toolbox that is available to us? Maybe there is a bigger toolbox available that could provide useful tools and nature could just be that gigantic toolbox. So what is that nature's toolbox? If I see a leaf with water droplets running off, I see an ultrastructural specialization of the surface of the leaf that makes that leaf surface super hydrophobic 
and therefore the bubbles run off very easily and by doing so they capture all the dirt that's on the leaf. So the leaf creates its own self-cleaning system. Translate that to a human health system and we're talking about medical applications that are covered with such, such a complex super hydrophobic surface which makes them self-cleaning and by doing so make them sterile. If I see a wasp stinging something in a substrate like that, I see a penetration device that can be moved in different directions with just a few control elements. Translate that to a human health system. We're talking about steerable catheters that can be kept very narrow because only a few control elements have to be going through the wire and you have a nicely controllable tip. If I see a bug taking off with its wings, I see an ingenious system of something that in origami style can be complexly folded up in something that is very compact, but when needed, being unfolded into a large surface, which is also strong at the same time, because the wings have to carry the whole insect in full mid-air. Translate that to a human health system and I see crisis and disaster equipment that can be easily transported in a very compact folded way, but at site being deployed into large structures which are light but still strong at the same time. If I see seahorses, I see a very special kind of body armor and the feeling it gives there, well, it's basically the same as this. I see a whole bunch of possibilities of what could be useful, including for human health system. So this brings me to my biomimicry story. That is seahorses and especially seahorse tail and seahorse skeleton. So the seahorses belong to the genus Hippocampus, which is also the name where the brain part is derived of because, well, with a little bit of imagination, one can recognize the shape of a seahorse. Seahorses are extremely special. They're fish, but they don't really look like fish. They're very progressive. Males get pregnant. And they have a body which is completely enclosed in body armor, and yet they have a prehensile tail. So that means nature has enabled them to protect their body with a skeleton, but at the same time, move that protective skeleton. So how can this be inspirational to human health? Well, first you might want, but yeah, as a tale, how useful could this be for human health? Well, people have tried it. What you're seeing here is engineers that have worked out a prototype of a tail inspired by a seahorse tail, which is attached to the body and which actually functions as a kind of haptic feedback system that stabilizes and counter moves with body movements and thus kind of alleviating mechanical loading on or wrong body positions um, while working at stations and things like that. A grasping device, well, people have worked out prototypes inspired by a seahorse tail to make grasping devices that can grasp objects of all kinds of shapes. How could this be relevant for medicine? Well, if you can manage to make this at the micro scale, you can again make steerable microsurgery tools. Is there more to it? Well, this is things that we are trying to explore. Um, and for that, we're using the biomimicry approach. What does this mean? Well, we're trying to understand how the biology works. We try to understand how bio biological functions are being performed. And from that, we then try to identify what are key traits that could be used for application. So here is, we're dealing with a system that can combine the function of being rigid and the function of being flexible at the same time, which seems paradoxical, being rigid and flexible at the same time. But yet, they can manage to do that. So that that's immediately starts to pop up, or they immediately start to pop up opportunities. And so we try to understand, okay, but what controls the rigidity? 
the plates, the tissues in between, the muscle control, what controls the, the movement, and so on. And which are then the key components if we want to make a system that needs to perform in a certain way, what are the key components we need? So things we are trying to explore is, for example, can we use the design of articulating plates and by playing with the biological traits, similar to that, playing with the rigidity versus flexibility and make intelligent braces where we can control the regional stiffness versus flexibility within a brace and thus, for example, speed up the healing process. Another thing we are trying to get funding for to do research is, for example, a supportive arm for immobile patients. An arm which is more flexible but stiff enough to support the patient, but is flexible enough to more dynamically adjust to the shape and the movement of a patient rather than what you're seeing here as a more um, solid and with few articulated elements robotic system. So where to go from here? This is a cross-disciplinary platform, which definitely and evidently brings all kinds of opportunities, but at the same time also brings all kinds of challenges. One challenge being, well, how far does one in the consortium dare to think and go out of the box? In general, and theoretically, there's always tons of possibilities to solutions. But then there are a bunch of filters that narrow down the solutions that finally make it, and of which one of them is then adopted. But because of these filters, there's no guarantee at all that maybe the best solution somewhere got filtered out. One of them being fear of mistakes. In an academic environment, of course, we try to avoid to make mistakes. We will not do of which we might have a certain idea that there will be mistakes made. Um, the other thing is that it's expertise uh, framework. That is, we all think within our own expertise, conceptually, technologically, and so on. So that means by bringing together these different expertise, as long as each one is still thinking within the box, it's just a bunch of boxes together and there's no added value. And then there is the professional limitation to how much creative we want to be. Do we want to go as far as, designer, as designers and artists, or do we say, no, that may not be professional within a research context? Then there's the issue of language. Different disciplines means different languages. Even within biomimicry, it is generally uh, acknowledged that language is an issue. Engineers and biologists speak different languages. The same will be the case if you bring more disciplines together. And then how open is the mindset of a network because you can bring brains together, you can bring expertises together, and they all will match one next to the other. But if there's no bridging and overlapping and synergy, the whole that comes out is actually not more than the sum of the components. So what you want to do is you want to open up, get rid of the borders, find maximal and optimized synergy, and make sure that what comes out is way more than the sum of the components. Thank you.